Chapter Five of Kitchener's Mop by James Norman Hill. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Vendetti. MikeVendetti.com. Kitchener's Mob by James Norman Hall. Chapter Five, The Parapet Etic School. We're going in tonight. The word was given out by the orderly sergeants at four in the afternoon. At four o three, every one in camp had heard the news. Scores of miniature hand laundries, which were doing a thriving business down by the duck pond, immediately shut up shop. Damp and doubtfully clean ration bags, towels, and shirts, which were draped along the fences, were hastily gathered together and thrust into the capricious depths of pack sacks. Members of the battalion sporting contingent broke up their games of two-penny brag without even waiting for just one more hand, an unprecedented thing. The makers of war ballads, who were shouting choruses to the merry music of the mouth-organ band, stopped in the midst of their latest composition and rushed off to get their marching order together. At four-ten, everyone, with the exception of the officer's servants, was all ready to move off. This, too, was unprecedented. Never before had we made haste more gladly or less needfully. But never before had there been such an incentive to haste. We were going into the trenches for the first time. The officers' servants, commonly called Batmen, were unfortunate rankers who in moments of weakness had sold themselves into slavery for half a crown per week. The batman's duty was to make tea for his officer, clean his boots, wash his clothes, tuck him into bed at night, and make himself useful, generally. The first test of a good batman, however, is his carrying capacity. In addition to his own heavy burden, he must carry various articles belonging to his officer. Enameled wash-basins, rubber boots, bottles of apollinaries water, service editions of the modern English poets, and novelists, spirit lamps, packages of food, boxes of cigars, and cigarettes, in fact, all of his personal luggage, which is in excess of the allotted thirty-five pounds which is carried on the battalion transport wagons. On this epoch-making day, even the officer's servants were punctual. When the order, Packs on, fall in, was given, not a man was missing. Everyone was in harness, standing silently, expectantly, in his place. Charge magazines! The bolts clicked open with the sound of one as we loaded our rifles with ball ammunition. Five long, shiny cartridges were slipped down the charger guide into the magazine, and the cutoff closed. Move off in column of route, A Company leading. We swung into the country road in the gathering twilight and turned sharply to our left at the crossroad where the signboard read to the firing line, for the use of military only. Coming into the trenches for the first time, when the deadlock along the western front had become seemingly unbreakable, we reaped the benefit of the experience of the gallant little remnant of the first British expeditionary force. After the retreat from Mons, they had dug themselves in and were holding tenaciously on, awaiting the long-heralded arrival of Kitchener's mob. As the units of the new armies arrived in France, they were sent into the trenches for twenty-four hours' instruction in trench warfare with a battalion of regulars. This one-day course in trench fighting is preliminary to fitting new troops into their own particular sectors along the front. The facetious subalterns called it the parapetic school. Months later we ourselves became members of the faculty, but on this first occasion we were marching up as the meekest of undergraduates. It was quite dark when we entered the desolate belt of country known as the Fire Zone. Pipes and cigarettes were put out, and talking ceased. We extended to groups of platoons in fours, at one hundred paces interval, each platoon keeping in touch with the one in front by means of connecting files. We passed rows of ruined cottages, where only the scent of the roses had neglected little front gardens reminded one of the home-loving people who had lived there in happier days. Dim lights streamed through chinks and crannies in the walls. Now and then blanket coverings would be lifted from apertures that had been windows or doors. 
and we would see bright fires blazing in the middle of brick kitchen floors, and groups of men sitting about them, luxuriously sipping tea from steaming canteens. They were laughing and talking and singing songs in loud, boisterous voices, which contrasted strangely with our timid noiselessness. I was marching with one of the trench guides who had been sent back to pilot us to our position. I asked him if the Tommies in the houses were not in danger of being heard by the enemy. He laughed uproariously at this, whereupon one of our officers, a little second lieutenant, turned and hissed in melodramatic undertones, "'Silence in the rank there! Where do you think you are?' Officers and men, we were new to the game then, and we held rather exaggerated notions as to the amount of care to be observed in moving up to the trenches. "'Ay, me son,' whispered our trench guide, "'you might think we was only a couple of hundred yards from Fritzy's trenches. We're a good two and a half miles back here. All right to be careful after you gets closer up, but they're no use a whispering when you ain't even in rifle range.' With lights, of course, it was a different matter altogether. Can't be too careful about giving the enemy artillery an aiming mark. This was the reason all the doors and windows of the ruined cottages were so carefully blanketed. Let old Fritzy see a light. Hello, he says, blokes in billets, and over comes a half dozen shells knocking you all to blazes. As we came within the range of rifle fire, we again changed our formation and marched in single file along the edge of the road. The sharp crack-crack of small arms now sounded with vicious and ominous distinctness. We heard the melancholy song of the ricochets and spent bullets as they whirled in a wide arc high over our heads, and occasionally the less pleasing <laughs> those speeding straight from the muzzle of a German rifle. We breathed more freely when we entered the communication trench in the center of the little thicket a mile more back of the first-line trenches. We wound in and out of what appeared to, in the darkness to be a hopeless labyrinth of earthworks. Cross streets and alleys led off in every direction. All along the way we had glimpses of dugouts lighted by candles, the doorways carefully concealed with blankets or pieces of old sacking groups of Tommies, in comfortable nooks and corners, were boiling tea or frying bacon over little stoves made of iron buckets or biscuit tins. I marveled at the skill of our trench guide, who went confidently on in the darkness, with scarcely a pause. At length, after a winding, zigzagging journey, we arrived at our trench, where we met the Gloucesters. There isn't one of us who hasn't a warm spot in his heart for the Gloucesters. They welcomed us so heartily and initiated us into all the mysteries of trench etiquette and trench tradition. We were at best but amateur Tommies. In them I recognized the lineal descendants of the line Atkins, men whose grandfathers had fought in the Crimea and whose fathers in Indian mutinies. They were the fighting sons of fighting sires, and they taught us more of life in the trenches in twenty-four hours than we had learned during nine months of training in England. An infantryman of my company has a very kindly feeling towards one of them who probably saved his life before we had been in the trenches five minutes. Our first question was, of course, how far is it to the German lines? And in his eagerness to see, my fellow Tommy jumped up on the firing bench for a look with his lighted cigarette in his mouth. He was pulled down into the trench just as a rifle cracked and a bullet went ding ding from the parapet, precisely where he had been standing. Then the Gloucester gave him a friendly little lecture, which none of us afterward forgot. And look here, son. Never get up for a squint at Fritz with a fag on. He's got every sandbag along this parapet numbered, same as we got it. His snipers is a layin' for us same as ours is a land for m then turning to the rest of us now we ain't arskin to ave no burial parties but any of you blokes wants to be the stiff stand up where this guy lit its gas there weren't any takers and a moment later another bullet struck a sandbag in the same spot see he spotted you you'll keep a poppin away at that place for an hour open to get you lookin over again let's see if we can find him Give us that biscuit tin, Henry. 
Then we learned the biscuit tin finder trick for locating snipers. It's only approximate, of course, but it gives a pretty good hint at the direction from which the shots come. It doesn't work in the daytime, for a sniper is too clever to fire at it, but a biscuit tin set on the parapet at night in a badly sniped position is almost certain to be hit. The angle from which the shots come is shown by the jagged edges of tin around the bullet holes. Then, as the Gloucester said, give him a nice little April shower out of your machine gun in that direction. You may fetch him, but if you don't, he won't bother you no more for an hour or two. We learned how orders are passed down the line from sentry to sentry, quietly, and with the speed of a man running. We learned how the sentries are posted and their duties. We saw the intricate mazes of telephone wires and the men of the signaling corps at their posts in the trenches, in communication with brigade, divisional, and army corps headquarters. We learned how to sleep five men in a four-by-six dugout, and when there are no dugouts, how to hunch up on the firing benches with our waterproof sheets over our heads and doze with our knees for a pillow. We learned the order of precedence for troops in the communication trenches. Never forget that outgoing troops as a right-of-way. They ain't had no rest, and they're all slathered in mud, likely in dead beat for sleep. The coming troops are fresh, and they stand to one side to let the others pass. We saw the listening patrols go out at night, through the underground passage which leads to the far side of the barbed wire entanglements. From there they creep far out between the opposing line of trenches to keep watch upon the movements of the enemy and to report the presence of his working parties or patrols. This is dangerous, nerve-trying work, for the men sent out upon it are exposed not only to the shots of the enemy, but the wild shots of their own comrades as well. I saw one patrol come in just before dawn. One of the men brought with him a piece of barbed wire clipped from the German entanglements two hundred and fifty yards away. Tabby, have a look at this here. Three ply stuff, what you can hardly get your nippers through and to saw and saw, and when I had her at it, lummy, if they didn't send up a rocket, what bleed near it me in the head. Dike it to Captain Stevens, I heard him say. He's wantin' a bit of to show to one of his artillery blokes. He's got a bet on with him that it's three-ply wire. Now don't forget, Bobby, touch him for a couple of packets of fags. I was tremendously interested. At that time it seemed incredible to me that men crawled over to the German lines in this manner, and clipped pieces of German wire for souvenirs. "'Did you hear anything?' I asked him. "'Heard a flute, some Fritzy was a-playing of, and you ought to have heard him singing, doleful as hell.' Several men were killed and wounded during the night. One of them was a sentry with whom I had been talking only a few moments before. He was standing on the firing bench, looking out into the darkness when he fell back into the trench without a cry. It was a terrible wound. I would not have believed that a bullet could so horribly disfigure one. He was given first aid by the light of a candle, but it was useless. Silently his comrades removed his identification disc and wrapped him in a blanket. Poor old Walt, they said. An hour later he was buried in a shell hole at the back of the trench. One thing we learned during our first night in the trenches was of the very first importance, and that was respect for our enemies. We came from England full of absurd newspaper tales about the German soldier's inferiority as a fighting man. We had read that he was a wretched marksman. He would not stand up to the bayonet. Whenever opportunity offered, he crept over and gave himself up. He was poorly fed and clothed, and was so weary of the war that his officers had to drive him to fight at the muzzles of the revolvers. We thought him almost beneath contempt. We were convinced, in a night, that we had greatly underestimated his abilities as a marksman. As for his all-around inferiority as a fighting man, one of the Gloucesters put it rather well. Air, if the Germans is so bloomin' rotten, how is it that we ain't a fightin' somewheres along the Rhine, or in Austria-Hungary? No, they ain't a firin' wild. I give you my word. Not around this part of France, they ain't. What do you say, Jerry? Jerry made a most illuminating contribution to the discussion of Fritz as a fighting man. I'll tell you what. If ever I gets through this here war, 
if I as the luck to go home again, with me eyesight, I'll never feel safe when I sees a Fritzy, unless I'm a-looking at him through my periscope from behind a bit of cover. How am I to give a really vivid picture of trench life as I saw it for the first time? How make it live for others, when I remember that the many descriptive accounts I had read of it in England did not in the least visualize it for me? I watched the rockets rising from the German lines, watched them burst into points of light over the devastated strip of country called No Man's Land, and drift slowly down, and I watched the charitable shadows rush back like the very wind of darkness. The desolate landscape emerged from the gloom and receded again, like a series of pictures thrown upon a screen. All of this was so new, so terrible, I doubted its reality. Indeed, I doubted my own identity, as one does at times when brought face to face with some experiences which cannot be compared with past experiences or even measured by them. I groped darkly for some new truth which was flickering just beyond the border of consciousness. But I was so blinded by the glamour of the adventure that it did not come to me then. Later, I understood. It was my first glimmering realization of the tremendous sadness, the awful futility of war. End of chapter 5